Well, hey, Grace Fellowship, so happy that you're with us. Happy Easter. We're going to worship with each other right now, so let's do it. So when darkness, when darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own, when brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken, I won't be shaken. My fear, cause my fear, it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lies. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Sleek, there's power. Come on. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. Power in your name. It's my fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I. love you. God, our hearts are towards you, and we're so glad that we get to be together and worship you. We're so grateful for you, Jesus. This Easter, this space where we come in and we celebrate your victory and your resurrection. We love you, Lord. Church, the next song we're going to sing is Nothing But the Blood, and it's an old hymn, and we're going to sing it because it is nothing but the blood of Jesus that has saved us and that has given us victory that we get to walk in together. Sing what can wash. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
We're going to go ahead and take communion together right now, so uh, if you need to go get uh, whatever you're using for communion, do so, and feel free to pause me and uh, go get whatever you need. And again, communion is not about the elements, what you use, but it's about the heart. It's about remembering Jesus, remembering his sacrifice and who he is. And so if you're using right now coffee and toast, that's, that's so fine and, and so cool with us. Um, one of the coolest things about communion to me and why I love that we're doing it today is Jesus is the great common denominator. Jesus and, and what we're about to celebrate and do together brings us together. It unifies us. When we have Jesus, we have uh, so much in common, this beautiful thing about us. And right now when, when we're separated and we can't actually be in this building physically together, we get to do something that spiritually makes us together and brings us into one accord and brings us into one place. And so we're going to take communion. We're going to remember Jesus. We're going to celebrate and thank him for his sacrifice and celebrate and thank him for his victory. So Jesus was sitting with his 12 disciples and he took some bread off the table and he broke it and he said, this, this bread is my body and it's been broken for you. And every time you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. So let's go ahead and eat. And then Jesus grabbed a cup from the table and he said, 
this, this represents my blood, my blood that's been poured out for you, blood of the new covenant. Whenever you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. So let's drink. Jesus, we love you, and we thank you so much. God, we thank you for uh, this day. God, we thank you for Easter. Father, we celebrate right now. God, we worship you. God, I thank you that, that despite the fact that we're separated and we're not with each other, God, I thank you that, Jesus, you bring us together. And God, when we celebrate the cross and we celebrate your sacrifice and we celebrate your resurrection, God, we're together. God, I thank you that you have victory over sin, you have victory over death, and God, that gives us the freedom to live the life that we live. God, we're grateful. And God, we worship you and we praise you because you're worthy of it. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna sing a brand new song right now. It's called The Blessing. And we wanna sing this over you, over your families, over this situation. And if you don't know the words, that's, that's totally fine. Let this song just be a blessing to you. So we're going to do this song together.
his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and you go away you weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 he is for you
Jesus, we thank you so much for the blessing that you are, the sacrifice that you made for us because you love us. God, your love for us is unconditional, God. Your, your love for us knows no bounds, Lord, and, and there's nothing we can do but just say thank you, Lord. So we thank you on this Easter Sunday, Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the blessing, for the favor that you pour on us, God. We thank you that we matter to you more than anything and everything, Jesus, and we trust you. Let us give back all that we have and all that we are, God. Lord, we ask that this year, God, in the midst of all the craziness, Lord, that this year be another year of blessing, God. We thank you that you've still got plans, that you are present in this year in 2020. Amidst everything that feels like it's going wrong, Jesus, you are present. You are still on the throne, so we trust you. And we say, have your way in this, Lord. And we ask that you just give us all that we need, Lord. Let us, let us bring your kingdom here. Let us, let us be your people, God. Let us do what you have called us to do. We love you. We trust you. We thank you, God. We thank you for your favor, for your blessing, for your unconditional love. We love you so much, and we thank you again for the sacrifice that you've made for us so that we can be with you forever. We worship you, Jesus. It's in your perfect and matchless name that we all pray, and everybody said amen, amen, amen. Well, church, happy Easter. Thank you so much for being with us today. We hope you're excited. Hey, even though we're at home, we hope you are enjoying your Easter Sunday so far. We know we are, uh, and we know things, again, are different, but happy Easter. We are glad that you are with us. Uh, if you're a first-time guest, welcome to Grace Fellowship Church. It is such an honor to have you with us on this Easter Sunday. Um, again, first Easter for you, maybe. We know it's different, but again, we are so, so happy that you are here. Just want to let you know, if you are a first-time guest, um, there's some links and stuff that you can check out in the description below, or in, yeah, in the description below. A few links if you want to check out more about Grace Fellowship Church. Um, we would love for you to check everything out on our website and all those links, but thank you for being with us, and happy Easter to you. Uh, to everybody else, we don't have much for you today other than, again, a happy Easter, and next week, we want to let you know that next week we are starting a brand new series uh, called You Asked For It. So this is something that we like to do every year here at Grace, and it's a series where we dig into any question that you might have as the church, as the congregation. So for you first-time guests, maybe you've never been to church and you have questions about God or about church or about life itself um, that you've been wanting to hear somebody talk about on a church platform, this is your opportunity. You get the opportunity to decide what we preach, what we talk about on a Sunday uh, for the next few weeks. So if you haven't asked a question yet, um, we've had a survey going on Facebook and online. Uh, we would love for you to get online, and uh, there's a link in the description below for this as well, where you can ask questions uh, that we, we will do our best to talk about, that the questions that people are asking the most. We want to dig into those and see what God says, what His Word says about those. So look for that link, ask those questions, and again, we would love to have you with us next Sunday here at Grace Fellowship Church. Well, guys, we love you so much. And again, happy, happy Easter. We hope you have an amazing rest of your day. We miss you. We love you. We've got a video that we would like to show you that was put together by our creative team. So take a look at your screen.
Good morning. My name is Josh Trueblood, and I'm pastor here at Grace Fellowship Church. And I just want to say happy Easter to you. And I know some of you guys are from Grace, and some of you guys are um, maybe brand new and just catching us online for the first time. Some of you are in Oklahoma, and some of you guys are not in Oklahoma. Wherever you are, I just want to say happy Easter and welcome to you. We are so glad that you are celebrating the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, with us today, this Easter. So let's pray and ask God to come into this time in his word. Lord Jesus, Lord, we depend on you. We lean on you, God. Even on Easter Sunday, Lord, we need you. We need you to come and and fill our words, Lord. Fill our thoughts with you. Um, God, we don't want to just talk about your word. We want your word to come in power and to change us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died for us, Lord, like like we're celebrating today. We thank you that you rose again on our behalf. And Lord, I pray that you would give a special blessing, Lord, over this message. And Lord, I pray that every moment of it would just drip with the love of God. I pray that we would just sense your presence here, that you would be here in power to change us. Thank you, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. It is my job to celebrate Jesus Christ and all he did for us today. And so um, I'm going to tell you the old, old story, the story of Jesus. See, uh, Jesus, I want you to see him and I want you to engage your imaginations right now. And I want you to see Jesus walking into Jerusalem and knowing what he was walking there to do, that he was walking there to die for us and and him giving himself up and him being arrested and, and, and even struggling in Gethsemane and saying, God, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will be done, Lord. And, and all the things that Jesus went through and the flogging and the crown of thorns and as he went to the cross and as they nailed his hands and they nailed his feet, it was all for us, amen, it was all for us. And as Jesus hung on that cross, he did so willingly. And that's so important because he says, you know what? No one takes my life from me. He says, I will only lay it down willingly because he was God. He could choose whether or not he was going to die on that cross. And at one point he said, don't you think that I could even call on a legion of of angels to come and rescue me if I wanted? But he stayed there on that cross willingly and died for us. And, and some of you may, may remember the prayer that he prayed, the son of God, our savior on that cross prayed, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And of course, I think immediately he was thinking about the people who were crucifying him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But I don't think it was just them. I think Jesus saw all the people, every man and woman down through history that were all sinning and, and not knowing what it was that we were actually doing, the damage that we were creating through our sin. And Jesus, in his heart and in his love for people, said, Father, forgive all of them, for they know not what they do. And I love that about Jesus. And then he said, it is finished. Um, he said, it is finished. And when he said it, it truly was finished. And, and what Jesus meant by that is him paying the full price that God required to forgive us of our sins was finished. That he was the substitute for us to, to die in our place. See, he suffered. Every single moment that he suffered what, what was, was him taking on our suffering that we deserved for our sin. And when he paid all of that, when he, when he emptied out the cup of God's wrath, he said, it is finished. He had done it all for one reason. He had substituted himself on our behalf for one reason. Please hear this. Jesus had done it because he loved us. Jesus loves you today. That's what Easter is all about. And then three days after Jesus died, Three days of quietness, Friday and Saturday and Sunday, Jesus came back to life. Here's how C.S. Lewis describes this. He says, C.S. Lewis once said, he said, uh, when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in a traitor's stead, said the table would crack and death itself 
would start working backward. It would start working backward. I just, I love that picture of death into resurrection that one moment Lewis said it could even be possible that somebody had to be totally innocent. And if that innocent person would die for the guilty, death would unravel itself and start working backwards. And that's what we see when Jesus came back to life. See, Jesus was not resuscitated. I need you to know that today. He was not resuscitated. See, re- being resuscitated, that's what happens when you, when you pass out or when you go into a coma or something like that. But you can't pass out for three days. He was dead for three days. He was not resuscitated. He was resurrected. He came back from the dead. The scriptural language is that Jesus Christ conquered death. Jesus impossibly and supernaturally and victoriously came walking out of the tomb three days after he died. This is Acts chapter 2 verse 24. It says, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life. For death, look at this, could not keep him in its grip. Death could not keep hold of Jesus. On the very first Easter Sunday, 2,000 years ago, here's how it went down. See, Jesus had risen from the dead, had left the tomb. Angels had come and rolled the stone away, but God's people didn't know that. The disciples didn't know that. And, and, and some of the ladies that were tra- had been traveling with Jesus, they loved him so much. They came early in the morning on Sunday, the scripture says, and they brought with them spices and perfumes. And the reason they did is because they still expected him to be dead. And so they came to anoint his body because they didn't want him to smell. And when they came, they got the shock of their lives. There were angels there instead of a dead body. And the angel said, he is not here, he is risen. And then Jesus, from that point forward, starts appearing to all these people that had cared about him. He appeared to the 11 disciples. And, and, and when he did, it was, it was very uh, specific how he showed himself to them. Some of the accounts uh, even seem a little bit weird, but what, what it's doing is it's displaying the way that Jesus' new body worked because he wasn't just spirit. He was a new, immortal person person. And so he would like walk through walls and then he would come and show up to the disciples and, and he would say, now give me some food to eat because he wanted to show them that he was a physical body that could eat food. And then Jesus would cook food and then he would say, come and touch the scars in my hands where I was crucified for you. And, and they did and they were able to see that it truly was him and he was there physically before them. There was even one moment when Jesus appeared to 500 people at once. See, this is not just a small collective of people that made up some stories about Jesus. 500 eyewitnesses all simultaneously saw the risen Jesus Christ after he had died. 1 Corinthians 15 says this. It says, Jesus was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. And he was seen by Peter. And, and watch it give us a list of all the people that saw Jesus. And then by the 12. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of whom, it says, are still alive, though some have died. See, Sometimes we say things like, I believe Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible tells me so. And while that's true, it's not all there is to it. See, I don't just believe in an old document. I don't just believe in a religion. What these people did, they all saw Jesus themselves. They were eyewitnesses of history. And they went and they recorded their eyewitness accounts of what they saw. And their historically accurate documents are with us today in the scripture. And those people didn't just write it down. They died for Jesus. If you know the history, you know that as the Christian movement began to take off and churches were planted all over the ancient world, that governments came against them and the Jews and the Romans came against them. It was not an easy thing to be a Jesus follower, especially one of the head leaders of the Jesus movement at that time. And many of them gave up their lives for this belief in a risen Savior. Now, if it was made up, if it was a lie, you wouldn't be martyred for that but they believed because of what they had seen and heard and touched themselves. That should fill you with so much faith and encouragement today here on Easter Sunday. Um, 
back when COVID-19 was not yet a thing and we were not yet sheltering at home, our church, Grace, painted these windows all around Lawton because we wanted them to encourage people all the way up until Easter Sunday. And they used this artwork and the artwork was, you can see it right there in the picture, a foot crushing a snake. Now, in my opinion, this may go down as one of the weirdest logos in Grace Fellowship Church's Easter history. Now, my daughter painted several of these windows, and she told me later, Davey told me later, that several people came up to her while she was painting the snake on the window and said, why in the world are you sitting here painting a snake being crushed by a foot for Easter? What's that got to do with Easter? So I'll ask you there at home, what's it got to do with Easter? Here's the answer. Because Jesus crushed Satan at Easter. So let's go back to Genesis for a second because you got to get the prequel. You got to get the backstory in order to understand just how good this is. If you remember, God gave Adam and Eve this garden to live in and he gave them all these trees. Do you remember that? And then he just gave them one tree and said, this is the only one tree that you can't touch. And of course, just like every other human being, they made a beeline and ran right for the one thing that they couldn't do. And they rebelled against God and they disobeyed him. And it was this terrible grievous moment and God came and he pronounced judgment on them because of their sin and when God did that he said all men would die as a result of their sin and he said that all of creation would now from this point forward be cursed he also said that all moms would give birth but they would give birth in a painful way and, and I know some of this stuff is not cheery Easter story stuff, right? But you got to hang in here with me. And then God turned to the serpent. Now, why does God turn to a serpent? Because it was a serpent that had come and had tempted Adam and Eve to fail. And so God turns to the serpent in this mo- moment and he says this. This is Genesis 3.15. It says, and I will cause, this is God speaking, I will cause hostility between you and the woman, he says, and between your offspring and her offspring. And he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Now God's making a prophecy about a man and a snake. Now the man is Jesus and the snake is Satan. Now some people wonder how do we know the snake is Satan? Because in Revelation chapter 10 verse 2 it tells us that satan or the devil or that old serpent it talks about and it it connects all those things together for us what i love about god is even in maybe one of our darkest moments when we've rebelled against god they're in the garden and the curse is coming out of his mouth the judgment is coming out of his mouth god so loves us that he immediately speaks the prophecy about how we'll be saved at the same time I love that about him. He says, a savior is going to come, Satan. And a savior is going to crush you. Jesus would come one day and be the snake crusher. Now, down through history, people have had a lot of different opinions about Satan, right? About the devil. Um, Some of them have been worse than other ones. Like he's this little red guy with horns, right? And he's always making trouble with people. Most of that stuff is all wrong. Most of those pictures have been wrong. The way the Bible describes Satan, that the original Hebrew word actually for Satan is the accuser. He's the one who who accuses, and he accuses God's people every day. It's his, it's his chief power. He has other things that he can do as well, but his chief power, the, the main weapon in his arsenal against us, Satan, is to accuse God's people every single day. Satan, you might want to think of him like this. He's like a prosecutor in the courtroom, and his job is to build a case against you. You're the one on trial. And here's the problem. For most of us, if you're anything like me, we have given Satan a whole lot of material to work with across our lives. We've blown it a lot, right? And when I die and when I go into God's heavenly courtroom and I'm judged, Satan will stand up and he will yell, this guy deserves hell. And they'll say, God, the reason he deserves hell is because you've, you'll, you've seen what he's done. And he can do this for everybody. He, you can see, God, the lies 
I can tell you, Lord, about the betrayals that this person has done. I can tell you about the money they've stolen. I can tell you about the way they lost their temper and raged against their kids and the way that they betrayed their parents and and the greed that's been in their life. And, and, And he could go on and on and on for many of us. And all it would take really is for him to just tell God in that courtroom, let me tell you about their worst day. Let me tell you about their worst day when they failed the most. And these are the things that led up to it. And look at the destruction. Look at the path of destruction as a result of their choices. See, make it personal for you right now. What's your worst day? What's the one day? It's like maybe you haven't even told your spouse about that day. Maybe nobody even knows about it. But man, if you were judged according to that one day before God, it would really have you worried. See, Satan's going to go right after that day. And he's going to say, God, because they did these things, they deserve justice. And in that moment, the God of all the earth in that courtroom will look at you and look at Satan and say, you're right. They deserve justice. And they deserve hell. They're guilty. So where's Jesus in all this, right? Come on, pastor, let's get to the good news. Where's the love of God in the midst of all this? See, Jesus comes to save us from the accuser. And and, and you need to know, he doesn't doesn't try to take a shortcut. Jesus doesn't come to God as the judge and say, listen, you need to look the other way on this. You know, they didn't mean it. It's not that big of a deal, right? Why don't we just sweep this under the rug? See, Jesus doesn't do any of that. He doesn't go for a shortcut. Jesus' solution to the accuser is something much deeper. And it's described in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. It says, verse 14, Because God's children are human beings, made of flesh and blood, the Son, that's Jesus, also became flesh and blood. See, this is how he saved us. For only as a human being could Jesus die. And only by dying could Jesus break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all those who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So it says Jesus, by becoming a human being, by living a perfect life, And by dying on the cross for us, his sacrifice paid for your sins. And when he did that, he crushed the serpent. He broke the serpent's power. He took the fangs and the venom out of the viper. Do you see what I'm saying here? He defanged him. Revelation 12 verse 10 says it like this. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last. Salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down to earth. The one who accuses them before our God day and night. And I think what it's describing there, that moment of Satan being thrown down to earth, the accuser being thrown down, is the moment that Jesus died for us and paid the penalty for us. Satan no more has any power. See, Jesus comes into the courtroom And he looks at the judge and he says, listen, I agree they're guilty. And I agree they deserve hell and judgment. But what I've decided to do is is to substitute myself for them. I'm going to pay the price for what they've done. And and, and that's going to mean something. Like, I'm going to become a human being and I'm going to suffer the way that they suffer. And when I go on that cross and, and it actually causes me physical and emotional and spiritual pain, that's all going to be real. So I'm going to go through hell for them. For every lie, like, God, you could, you could tally up Every lie done by every single person, every, every act of stealing done by every single person, every adultery, every betrayal, everything across all of time. And God, you decide how much it costs and I'll suffer for all of it until the whole cup of God's wrath is poured out on me. For God so loved the world. Jesus endured it. <laughs> Isn't it weird Christians, even on a happy day like today, we talk about Jesus' flesh and his blood and 
We talk about nails and we talk about a cross, which let's be real, it's an, ex- it, it's an execution device, right? Um, why do we talk about, why, why do we call Friday when Jesus died Good Friday? It's because that's when he loved us the most. For God so loved the world. Jesus didn't come to just be a good teacher. He came to die. Romans 5 verse 6 says it like this. It says, when we as human beings were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and he died for us sinners. Mark 10 45 says it like this. It says, Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for many. It's it's, it's like we were in bondage and Jesus pays a ransom to rescue us, which is exactly what happened. 1 Peter 2 24 It says Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross. And what it means is he carried the guilt as if he was guilty. By his wounds, you are healed. Hebrews 9, 26 says it like this. But now, once for all time, he has appeared at the end of the age to remove sin by his own death as a sacrifice. And I love how it says it there in Hebrews 9 because it says it already happened once for all time. It never has to happen again. Jesus will never have to die for you ever again. And you'll never have to die for your own sins ever again if you receive his gift. Once for all time. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 21 says, Just as death came into the world through Adam. That's that first man. Now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. That's the love of God. So Jesus is willing to go into that courtroom for you and he purchased your forgiveness for you. So you never have to pay it again. But the way that God puts this together is it's, it's a gift that you also have to receive from him. It'll never be forced on you. You'll never be coerced to be a Christian by God. You'll never be coerced or, or no one will ever twist your arm to get you into heaven. It will always be your choice. And that's so critical to become a Christian, you have to choose to become a Christian. And, and, and some of you have not done that yet. And, and maybe you even uh, tuned in to watch this video today and, and to do this service. And, and maybe you even came wondering if today was your day that you were going to give your heart to Jesus Christ forever. I'm going to give you a chance to do that at the end of the service. And I know this is weird that I'm going to hit pause on this right now. But there's a few more things that I want to say to you before I give you that chance. But we are going to pray together. Okay. A couple more things that I I want us to get out of this Easter Sunday message that I think is just going to enrich you. Especially if you have already chosen to believe in Jesus Christ. He has come and he has defeated the accuser for you. Amen. And he has come and he has defeated the power of death for you. So I've got two questions for you. And this is just the practical stuff. And I think this leads to a lesson for us. If Jesus has done those things for us as believers... Why do, number one, why do so many of us continue to live with a sense of guilt? And then number two, if Jesus has conquered death, why are many of us still afraid of death? So we're going to dive into both of those things. Very first one is, is why do we still live in guilt? And I'll start this one with a story. There was a guy that I grew up with and and I grew up with him in my own church, um, and we went to the same kind of Sunday school classes together and, and, and we watched the same Bible stories uh, illustrated on flannel graphs, you know what I mean? And, and, but his life never changed. He was a church attender, but his life never changed. And I remember when he and I were both adults and we were really wrestling with our faith, he said to me at one point, he said, he said, Josh, I really struggle to give my life to Christ on a regular basis. And the reason I do is because I know my past and I know what I've done and I know what I'm guilty of. He said, and the Bible says that Jesus forgave me for all of that. He's like, but I just can't believe it. I can't believe that all that could truly be forgiven. And it stopped him dead in his tracks spiritually. I grew up in a kind of a religious environment and I mean, Wonderful home. But as a religious kid, as a church kid growing up, there were a lot of things that I misunderstood. 
and I thought, man, I've got to be a good kid. You know, I, I've got to read the Bible and I've got to go to church and I've got to be really good morally. And, and depending on your denomination or, 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 or the way that you were raised, maybe there was like a top five sins that you didn't want to do and you wanted to stay away from those, right? Like you wanted to be a moral person. I get it. And it's like, I really wanted to do that, but, but I still felt accused by the accuser, if I can say it that way. I still felt guilty. I still felt like I was never good enough. And I felt like maybe what God wanted from me as a good church kid is he wanted me to feel perpetually guilty because let's be real, I could always do better. And I believed this lie that if I felt more and more guilty, maybe that would make me more and more moral. Like I was beating myself up with a spiritual club. And that was never what God had for me. It was never it was never what he wanted. Turn it this way. Why would Jesus die and suffer to pay for all my sins and then turn around and want me to continually punish myself for those same sins? He would never want that. He wanted me free because, again, he loves us. He loves us. It's the core of who he is. And it drives everything that he does. We have to remember that. Romans 8 verse 1 says it beautifully. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. I'll say it one more time. There is no condemnation. Read there. There's no guilt. There's no judgment. There's no hell. There's none of that that's for those who belong to Jesus Christ. We're supposed to be free of that. In the church, we love to do testimonies. <clears throat> we love to tell our story, right? And, and I love the honesty that's in the church when we tell our testimony. Because it's supposed to be there. Like we start and we say, listen, this is everything that I did wrong. And here's my dark past. And here's the people that were hurt. And we're supposed to tell the bad news. It's part of it. But we don't stop there. We say, no, this is when Jesus came in. Yeah, that was my past, but here's when Jesus came in and he forgave me. And now I no longer have to be beat up about that. And, and the hero of the story, when we tell a testimony, right, is Jesus. Because he's the one who loved me and died for me. And the accuser, by the way, he's got no teeth in him. So that's why, why, do, we, why do we let the accusation come to us? I'll just say one last thing about that. When I finally started to realize as a Christian that God did not want me to stay in a place of guilt, that he wanted me to launch forward and free and strong in the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ, when I realized that was part of his love for me, my faith went to a whole new level. And I pray it does for you too. Next is fear of death. Why do we still struggle with the fear of death? If Jesus... If Jesus conquered death and we no longer have to be afraid, then why are we often still afraid? And the very first thing that you're probably thinking right now is, I don't know, pastor. I don't know that I actually am afraid of death. Are you sure I'm actually afraid? Of l l let me see if I can illustrate it this way. Why are we so often afraid of the dark? Why do we spend so much money on security systems and worry so much of our life about locked doors. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to have locked doors, of course, or security systems or anything like that. But can we be real? Sometimes we do that stuff and sometimes we do that stuff because what's underneath it is a real deep fear for us that we want to be in control and we're concerned about the future. And, and sometimes it gets so much inside of us that, that, that a sickness comes along and we're willing to go into treatments that are so costly and painful and they're worse sometimes than the sickness that we started with. And it, it, it's like if we're real, we're kicking and clawing and, and we're trying to get every final moment that we possibly can on this earth because we're terrified of what comes next. Why? why? Why do wealthy people want a building named after them after they leave? Why, why are we so concerned about our legacy? Why, why is one Super Bowl ring not enough? You got to have six. You got to be in the record books, right? Like, why is that important to us? Is it that we're trying to hold on to some kind of legacy that makes us feel in this very 
shallow, pale kind of way, like we are eternal in the minds and memories of other people. Why does that matter to us if we're eternal beings and if we have heaven in our future? Why are we scared to go to funerals? Why are we scared sometimes to be in a hospital and and to be around death? Could I submit to you that part of the reason that we squirm at all of that stuff is because it makes us think of deep things like sin and death and the limit of our own life. And that bothers us and we don't like to think about that. We'd like to, what we'd really like to do is stay in the illusion that we often are in where we don't have to think about those things, that we just kind of go from day to day to day, doing our thing, uh, you know, ma- making relationships and loving life and living life and, 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 and don't bother me with the details, right? Don't bother me with those, those big eternal kind of thoughts. Like we would like to stay in the illusion. One pastor, John Piper, gave this illustration. He said, it's like cruise control. It's like we want to hop in the car, we want to get in the car, go down the highway and set it at 65 miles per hour, cruise control or 70 miles per hour if you're in, Oklahoma on the highway, right? Like you're going down the road and and you've got the radio on just at the right volume and you've got the air conditioner on at just the right temperature and you're driving along and everything's great and everything's right as long as nobody bothers you. But what happens when there's that, that person who's in the left lane and they're going 40 miles per hour and God bless them. Why do they do that, you know? But, th- but that person's there and all of a sudden you've got to hit the brakes and you've got to slow down because that person's in your way. And what does it do is it wakes you up out of the illusion, wakes you up out of the dream and you've got to deal with reality. And then what do you want to do? You want to, you want to reset all those things back to comfort again. This is how we often live our lives. And, and, and part of the reason we say, well, I, I don't know that I've got a fear of death is because we're not allowing ourselves to even think about it. We're just, we're so much in the comfort and we want our life to go on undisturbed. But what happens when we do get disturbed? What happens when cancer comes and we're disturbed? What happens when a sudden loss of a loved one and we're shaken out of the illusion and all of a sudden everything's real and we have to deal with life and death and all of a sudden it hits us like a ton of bricks. Why did it hit us like a ton of bricks? Because we were living in the illusion. God wants us awake today. And this COVID-19, guys, this COVID-19 season that we're in, this extreme trial that we're in right now, it's like a smack to all of us. I mean, every single day on the news, we're getting hit with new numbers. And, and those numbers are dark. It's, it's, it's the number of people sick. It's the number of people that have died today. Could you ever imagine in your life, you would be checking the news every single day to get today's death number? I mean, it's shocking. And it's, it's got all of us out of our comfort. We're all not smooth sailing at all right now. And it, and it rocks us to our core. It's like a slap and it's been like a global slap to all of us and we're all thinking about life and death. And one of the big questions that I feel like every single one of us, you're, what, you're, you're, you're thinking this thought right now, whether you know it or not, will I get sick? Will I die? And you're wondering, and we're not saying it out loud, but everybody across the world is asking themselves that question right now. We're rattled. Why are we? Jesus loves you. That's the answer. Is the same Jesus that died for you on a cross, the same Jesus that came boldly out of that tomb victorious, the same Jesus that did all of that for you to love you, to save you, his plan is to save you every single day of your life. He's carrying you. He's the one who knows about your tomorrow. He's the one that knows exactly how this will end for you and when. That will never happen to you by accident. When you close your eyes in death, it will be planned and chosen by God because he loves you. It will be the right moment for you. And when it happens, and I know this is hard to talk about, but when it happens, the scripture says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. 
That means when you close your eyes in death, you will immediately open them to Jesus, the one who has loved you all along. Isn't that a good thought? My dad, my father died this past February, not too long ago. And the days leading up to him dying, the, the, the moments, the hours, I was with him. I was right by his side. And I got to hear him take his final breaths. I got to be present with him. As a pastor, I've gotten to be present with a lot of people as they took their final breaths. And can I just tell you, that in a moment like that, yeah, the physical's real, but the physical just starts to, starts to bleed away and the spiritual becomes solid. And it's like a holiness comes in and God comes in. Eternity fills a room. I've seen it. I felt that. And, and when you go through that transition yourself, as your pastor, what I want for you is I want you to know the love of Jesus Christ in that moment. I don't want you afraid. I want you to know peace. And I want you to, I, I mean, I'm not saying that, that it's going to be easy. But we can go forward with the, with the strong confidence of what Jesus has planned for us in heaven. And, and our faith can, can, can add a peace to that whole time that just carries us carries us right into the everlasting arms. I want, when that time happens, can I just say, I want your, your shoulders to be relaxed. I want your fears to be silenced. I want everything to be about abandon. I want you to hear the loving call of your Savior. I've talked to people who've heard the loving call of their Savior, calling them home. And I want you to, to launch and run into the arms of Jesus. That's what... I want for you. There's a cool part of history that I want to give to you because I think it just makes this come alive even more and, and we'll close up with this. Um, after the Jesus movement started, so go back in history with me. 2,000 years ago, and Jesus has died and he's risen from the dead. And the Jesus movement starts and it goes like gangbusters, right? Turns the ancient world upside down. And like we talked about before, the Roman government starts to feel pretty threatened by this new Christian movement and they don't like it. And they start arresting Christians, if you know the history. And several Christians are martyred as a result. And, and some of them even are, are sent to the Colosseum in Rome. And Christians are killed there. And they're killed by gladiators in games sometimes or, 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 or they're killed by wild animals that are released upon those Christians. And again, I know that's morbid, but there's something precious and beautiful here I want you to see. So there were medical examiners at that time. And this was such a regular part of their life there in the Colosseum. So many Christians died for Jesus. And these medical examiners were there and they had this weird superstition at that time. And this is around 100 AD. So it's in the second century. And these medical examiners had this superstition that you couldn't touch a dead body. And so they would never perform an autopsy or a medical examination on a body, right? And so medical science at that time actually moved pretty slow. Their progress was pretty slow because they weren't willing to do that. And so what the, they would do is these doctors would, would be on the outskirts of the Colosseum and, and when they, the, the Christians were killed and they took the animals away and, and everything was safe, the medical examiners would run over to the Christians' bodies and they would watch them take their last breaths because they're trying to gather signs and trying to figure out what was going on. And there's one medical examiner, it's his name, Claudius Galenus. He wrote his observations in a medical journal of these Christians. And we still have it today. We still have this evidence with us today. And this is what Claudius Galenus said about these dying Christians as he watched them take their final breaths. He says, for fearlessness, that's his observation, fearlessness of death and the hereafter is something that we witness in these Christians every day. 100 years after Jesus, 
And what he says every single day, what they're used to seeing in these Christians in the Colosseum as they're dying and taking their last breaths is he's like, they're fearless. They're not scared of anything. I love that that was the legacy of those believers. And I believe Jesus has that for us today. I said earlier that we would pray. And so we're going to pray. The love of Jesus Christ, everything that he purchased for you, it's all available. And some of you just, you've never had your moment to take that. And Easter is a special time. People get saved on Easter Sunday. I love that. So I'm going to give you a chance to pray a prayer after me and to receive the gift of God. See, no one will ever be in heaven and say, how did I get here? (laughs) Okay, no one will ever be asked to worship God into eternity and say, I don't know that I signed on for this. Only Christians will be in heaven because they are the ones who said, I want Jesus. If this is who he is, this is how much he's done for me, then I want Jesus and I give my life to him. That's what salvation is. So I'm going to do this pastor thing. I'm going to walk you through this prayer and it's going to be a phrase at a time. And I'll give you the phrase and then I'll wait because what I'm doing is I'm trying to give you your chance to pray that prayer, that that phrase to God in your words. And God's amazing. And he can hear your thoughts. Maybe you're even in the living room surrounded by some people and you're just going to be thinking this prayer in your mind and that's totally fine. He can hear you. Make it real. He can tell if it's real. Let's pray. Lord God, we worship you. You are our Savior. You died for me. Thank you. Jesus, save me. Jesus, Forgive me for my sins. All my past. Everything I've ever done. Lord, the Bible says that you paid for it. So I want that gift. I give you my life, Jesus. I surrender to you. I want to be a Christian. Thank you, Lord. Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that, congratulations. And I love that you made such a decision. It's a, it's a lifelong decision. Um, and I want you to take some next steps. I don't want you to just stay right there and, and keep everything quiet and, and maybe forget tomorrow that this moment even happened for you. And so what I'd like to ask you to do is to text us. And I'm going to explain how in just a second, but if you were here in the church building with us and and you had made this decision and I knew about it, I'd want to come immediately over to you as your pastor and I would want to pray for you. And and I would want to give you one of our free Bibles so you could get going in your walk with Jesus because I wouldn't want you to stop there. It's It's just your first step. And so because we can't do that, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to text this number. And it's going to be on your screen right here below. And it's 31996. And I want you to text the word forever to that number. 31996. Because what you're saying is, Pastor, I just made a forever choice with Jesus. And what, what's going to do is you, you're going to text that. And it's going to give you a, a text back, just give you some technical information here. But it's going to text you back, and it's going to ask you to fill out just a little bit of information for security. And I just want you to know we're not trying to track you. I really don't care even what information you put in there. You can put Mickey Mouse in there for all I care. A lot of people last week, they just kept it blank, and it's totally fine. We're not going to show up at your house. We're not going to call you. It's going to give you a link 
to go to a next steps page and it's going to explain how to get the Bible. It's going to explain how to read it. It's going to explain how to get water baptized if that's your next step. It's going to explain how to get into a life group where you can have some other Christians encourage you. Jesus loves you. And I want you to know that. Praise him. We're so thankful for him this Easter. Happy Easter to you. Let's, let's worship some more. Oh,